Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick introduction of the panelists, although I think you all know them. Uh, on my immediate left is Professor Stephen Lubbin uh, of Seton Hall Law School uh, in New Jersey. Uh, I won't try the full title of your professorship, uh, that's but it's, for the best. It's, a, it's a long titled chair. Um, Chief Judge Cecilia Morris from the Southern District of New York sits mainly in Poughkeepsie, but also comes into Manhattan from time to time. Craig Goldblatt, uh, Wilmer and Hale. Uh, am I correct? You were the reporter for the LSTA's SWAT down of the, uh, of the ABI Commission's uh, uh, report on the reform of the uh, bankruptcy laws? I, I worked on the analysis of your terrific and thoughtful project. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve Young, a partner in Wild Gottschall's uh, Dallas office uh, with a long, uh, lot of experience in, in restructuring matters. Quite a term at the Supreme Court that ended last June, uh, five bankruptcy cases. Uh, and not the kind of bankruptcy case like uh, Pioneer uh, from uh, 20 years ago or so ago, where it was a generally applicable case to the, uh, the rules of civil procedure, the rules of bankruptcy procedure. But these cases, uh, except for one, uh, are strictly bankruptcy law cases. I, can't, I don't think I can remember um, any time since the code was enacted that the Supreme Court has taken up five in one year. I think four was the top before this. So uh, there's a lot to talk about. And the, the panelists are, uh, are going to tell you all about them. I'm going to start in the order on the, that is on the agenda uh, with discussing these cases. Uh, start with uh, Harris against Vagelon, um, a case involving the, uh, a conversion from Chapter 13 to Chapter 7. Judge Morris, do you want to give us a quick sure. crazy of the facts in that case? Yes, thank you. Um, basically, that was a, a debtor had filed a Chapter 13. Uh, the debtor was in arrears on his home mortgage. And under the debtor's Chapter 13 plan approved by the court, the debtor was to assume his monthly payments to the bank. Um, and in addition, he was, uh, there was a $530 a month withdrawal from his post-petition wages. Uh, he didn't pay his mortgage. It was foreclosed on. So after foreclosure, the, debt, the trustee continued to receive the, um, the, the $530 was being paid was being pulled out to pay his mortgage. Um, so the, the trustee continued to receive that money. So what happened was the trustee had about a little over $5,500 in his account. Let me just stop right there for a moment for all of you that practice in Chapter 11s. These are huge amount of monies for these people. It's a really interesting thing when you look at these cases and you think, oh, that's not much. This is a big amount of money for the people that come in front of us. Uh, let me throw in one other little thing. We had a group from Princeton and Harvard that's doing a study on Chapter 13s. And if someone goes right before someone files for Chapter 13, they're in as much stress as they would be as if they lost a child. Now, that's pretty dramatic stress. On the other side of it, they have put the statistics with the Social Security Administration and found out that if someone gets a discharge in bankruptcy in a Chapter 13, they live longer. So Chapter 13 is pretty important to a segment of the economy that many of you do not even see. So these amounts of money seem like a small amount, but to these individuals, this is a pretty dramatic happening in their life. So the, the, because of, it was a wage garnishment or a wage payment, the trustee continued to receive the amount for the uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, mortgage after the case was converted to a seven. And the trustee then paid some of those funds to the debtor's counsel and some of the funds to herself and distributed the remainings to um, the unsecured creditors. And the uh, Supreme Court basically says at, at Chapter 7 conversion, the money belongs to the debtor. And that's basically the end of the story. So, it goes back to the debtor. Uh, a case strictly of statutory interpretation. Absolutely. <clears throat> and the, the circuits were split on this? Uh, you know, I don't know the proster going in. Greg? Uh, the so. procedural, uh, 
and the big one on this is ha one of the things that's good about Chapter 13 is the attorneys can be paid through the plan. Well, the moment it converts to seven, does that mean the attorneys can't be paid anymore? Can the administrative expenses be yeah, paid? So, so this case came up from the, the Fifth Circuit. The right. Fifth Circuit had held um, that upon the <clears throat> debtor's payment of the funds to the trustee, the underlying creditors under the plan obtained a vested right in those funds. Um, the Third Circuit, in an opinion by Judge Ambrose, uh, said the opposite, said that um, essentially what the, what the Supreme Court said here, that upon conversion, um, the plan goes away and the money belongs to, to the creditors. Now, what was you know, interesting in this case, I, I thought, was, um, and I, sh I should confess by way of disclosure, we represented the Chapter uh, 13 trustee in this case. Oh, and I, okay. I argued it in front of the Supreme Court and persuaded none of the nine justices. So <laughs> let's see if I can do any better with this crowd. Um, um, the, the have, have you repented for that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the argument w w was as follows. Um, outside of bankruptcy, when there is a trust and there is a reason when the trust dissolves, um, the non-bankruptcy common law rule is that the trustee in that circumstance should take any undistributed funds and first distribute them um, to the beneficiaries of the trust and only after the, the, the beneficiaries <coughs> are satisfied does it return to the grantor. And so the argument that we advanced was there's nothing in the bankruptcy code that altered that sort of non-bankruptcy common law set of principles. Now the court just didn't engage that argument and viewed the case but, as basically but, a dispute between... Because they went to the uh, they Federal did. Rules of Bankruptcy Procedure, right. 10, 19, 4. And they did find something in the code. As I said, this was a statutory <laughs> exactly. that, 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 argument. Right. Now... Um, I'm, I'm done arguing with them about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, strictly a bankruptcy law case, any implications... Uh, I'm sorry, strictly a Chapter 13 narrow case. Court took it only because of the split in the circuits, or can we get any larger implications from this case? Well, there, there are a few issues that are, there are implications. As Judge Morris says, one of the questions has to do with um, the payment of counsel in Chapter 13 cases. This is, this is just about Chapter 13, but um, the, um, the... Well, it could in Chapter 11 if you have a conversion from an 11 to a 7, that which does happen. On, for an individual. Election. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. I think that, 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 that's fair. Um, you know, there are a few implications, right? One, one is... Um, uh, the, pay the payment of the debtor's attorney's fees. It's actually common practice in many jurisdictions in the cases of conversion for funds that are held by the trustee at the time of conversion first to pay the debtor's lawyer and thereafter to be returned to the well, debtor. Well, administrative expenses. It, exactly. The post-petition <coughs> fees of the Chapter 13 lawyer. I think most of the courts that have looked at this decision have said that practice is inconsistent with the holding of Harris versus Vigelin. Um, there's another related question that it has implications for, which is, okay, this is what happens when cases convert. What about when cases are dismissed? Um, and I think there, there is a recent decision in the Southern District of Illinois that basically says the same result obtained. The dismissal of the case under Section 349 puts everyone back in the position they would have been had the case never occurred. And so in that case, the money goes to the debtor. And there are the, the other sort of chapter 13, I think, important implication of, of the case, and the, the case only hints at it, is um, the question, you know, for those of us who practice mostly in chapter 11, we're used to thinking about the bankruptcy estate as something that exists between the petition date and the confirmation of the plan. Um, and in chapter 13, there's a real longstanding debate about whether the chapter 13 estate um, ends upon confirmation with the property of the state revesting in the debtor, as section 1306 says, or whether the funds that, the debtor's post-petition income that arises between the confirmation and the discharge at the end of the plan period is all property of the estate that is the subject of the authority of the bankruptcy court. And this case doesn't resolve that question, um, but there, it's certainly lurking in the background and is an important question that's to be continued. Professor? Well, the code could have been a little clearer on that point. <clears throat>
But uh, I mean, that, 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 that's... Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that, that strikes me as, as the big issue in, in this case, um, is you know, tr trying to wrestle with the, the sort of, what exactly does the estate mean in, in a Chapter 13 context? Well, and I, I can tell you that one of the hardest things for a judge are the attorney's fees in a Chapter 13. Because one of the Chapter 13s, for anyone that has never done one, they are difficult. And it is not simple and it is not straightforward. And you need expert counsel doing it. And these, some of these consumer lawyers are amazing lawyers. And the idea that they wouldn't get paid is sort of difficult because if I'm discouraging them from being in the courtroom, then we as judges have a difficult time uh, in that sense. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next case. I, I want to keep my eye on the clock. Um, let's talk about, because there are, as I said, there are so many of them. Uh, let's talk about uh, Bullard against Blue Hills Bank. Um, Steve, you want to start on that one? Sure. <clears throat> uh, the facts were fairly simple. It was a denial of a Chapter 13 plan. Uh, there was a specific legal issue that was important to that denial that the Chapter 13 debtor wanted to appeal and get a determination on that legal issue uh, because that would drive how uh, it could formulate its Chapter 13 plan with respect to housing. Uh, what I thought was a fairly consistent decision uh, the courts held and all the way through the Supreme Court, that denial of a plan that was left with a possibility of modifying the plan was not a final order uh, such that the appellate court shouldn't hear it because uh, appellate courts shouldn't do things that might end up becoming moot from their perspective uh, later on, so they shouldn't deal with it. Uh, the lesson I took away from that case, which is what I thought was sort of a uh, reprimand or reminder that if you're going to do this, at least first try to seek leave for an interlocutory appeal and don't uh, bother us in appellate courts uh, with your issue until I know I've got something really to decide. Uh, does it apply in Chapter 11? Supreme Court doesn't make any distinction here between 13 and 11, but does it apply in 11? What do you think, Professor? I think the, lang the language suggests it does. I think, I think it'd have to. I would, would also mention that this opinion, I think, contains my nominee for the most tone-deaf statement uh, of the Supreme Court's term where the Chief Justice kind of says, well, you know, if, if the appeal's wrong, the debtor will end up paying a little bit more money, but oh. yeah. yeah. And, and the numbers he- He didn't hear your comment about the $500 <laughs> a month. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Exactly, and, that, and that's the thing that you see about these consumer cases that are at the Supreme Court. Uh, quite often, it sounds as if there's no one there that actually has a reality check on these individual debtors. Uh, the dismissal of a Chapter 13 is the death of a Chapter 13. I mean, not dismissal, the uh, denial of confirmation. The Chapter 13 trustee uses the uh, denial of confirmation to bring the motion to dismiss. And more than likely or not, you're going to be dismissing that case. There well, is really no that recourse. Can then be appealed. Excuse me? <laughs> then that's the final order that can be appealed, as the Supreme Court says. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. I think, I think yes. we also have to wonder but, how many appeals actually happen in most thir Chapter 13 cases. Well, it, it, I can tell you again, I'll just go back from personal experience so you know this. When I hire my law clerks, one of the things that I talk to them about is we are really the final court. There is no way they can afford an appeal. So you, our job is to try to get it as right as possible for these individuals who really are trying and have themselves in a circumstance that they cannot get out of without a consumer result. <clears throat> so the, uh, I, I think they trivialized, I, this was, they, they basically even said the bankruptcy court, oh the bankruptcy court usually rules right. You know, you could take that as a compliment, <laughs> but you could also take it as they sort of, you can say, oh you really have confidence in me or that they trivialize these cases. I, so. I took it as the former. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, so to, we'll get to wellness and, yeah. and just. Craig, it looks like you're anxious to say something. About <clears throat> no, I think the, the implications of this are, um, are, I think, quite 
important and profound, right? One of, one of the landmark cases in, the, in our world is the Third Circuit's decision in SGL Carbon, which talks about the limits of good faith filing. That case arose um, from a motion to dismiss a bankruptcy case that was denied by the bankruptcy judge, and the denial of that motion to dismiss was appealed, and the Third Circuit reversed, saying that a case that was filed essentially for tactical advantage was not filed in good faith. Now, there's a circuit split that exists to this day okay. on the appealability of the denial of a motion to dismiss. I think the Supreme Court's reasoning um, uh, in this case, in Bullard, suggests that the Third Circuit precedent that says that that order is an appealable order is probably wrong, and that that type of precedent, it, had it come following Bullard, we wouldn't have today. Although in Bullard, the, the court did suggest that there were avenues for interlocutory appeal to the courts of appeals, yes? Correct. So, so they could take it up that way. Um, there have been two reported decisions at the intermediate appellate level since Bullard uh, in the Chapter 11 context. Uh, Judge Morris, you, you're Well, you have South Street Morrison versus South Hadley. In that one, it was a voluntary petition for a Chapter 11 prior to a sheriff sale. Um, the bankruptcy court denied South Street's motion to allow the state court receiver to keep control of the property, and the U.S. trustee filed a motion to dismiss. The bankruptcy court denied both. It went to the district court. Um, the uh, S and H, South and Headley, filed, uh, said that the uh, district court did not have jurisdiction, and then the trustee argued the district court lacked jurisdiction to hear, hear the appeal based on Bullard. And the district court agreed. <clears throat> mm -hmm. The district court agreed. And there was another one in Ray Woodward from the Eighth Circuit BAP. Um, I think both of those opinions, if you look at them, uh, there's very little reasoning. They just conclude, well, Bullard, and right. therefore the motion, denial of motion to dismiss is and not And here's appealable. the quote from the Eighth Circuit. The denial of the confirmation of the debtor's third amended Chapter 11 plan is not a final order and cannot be the subject of this appeal, end quote. Unlike, um, uh, say, the Supreme Court's decision in Till on interest rates, a Chapter 13 case, where they specifically called out in a footnote that this might not apply in a Chapter 11. No such distinction made in, uh, in Bullard. Uh, 